Good day and welcome to another episode of Friday Drinks, our first episode of the year. I hope you had a fantastic Christmas and we wish you all the best uh, in the new year. This is uh, another episode of our irrever irrever irreverent show where we discuss, uh, where a bunch of friends get together and discuss uh, the issues of the day and some issues that uh, you shouldn't take too seriously. Um, today, I'm joined by Tinasha as usual and um, a friend of ours who perhaps you ought to take a little bit more seriously. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, <clears throat> Temba um, is not only a friend but a mentor who's run a public listed company for more than a decade and we're delighted to have him on the show. Um, so as usual, uh, we're going to start with uh, what everybody's drinking. What, Tinashe, okay. what are you starting the new well, year with? Timber is going to join me. And uh, we've got a, a fan from the UK who sent through an L Grey tea. So we're very grateful, uh, Christine. Thank you very much for the tea. And that's what we're going to have. Um, and yeah, I'm going to enjoy it. And I hope you will enjoy it as well. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So I'm going to pour. And you? You're yeah. not drinking today. <laughs> Well, I am drinking. I do have a drink. Um, but, uh, oh, certainly uh, it's a drink. Yes, it certainly is a drink. But uh, I'm taking January off the source, you know, a, a month of uh, sobriety and uh, detoxing. So um, this is uh, some pressed, it's, it's, it's a concoction, it's, it's a detox uh, potion. It's basically pressed uh, fresh um, spinach, lemon, ginger, apple, and courgette. So, it's uh, not medicine. It's not medicine, no. It's, uh, it's just freshly pressed uh, juice, okay. um, and it's meant to help detox after a very silly, silly season. <laughs> <laughs> after a happy season. Yeah, so um, perhaps we can start with you, Temba, and mm -hmm. you know, may, you know, look back at uh, last year. And you know, from your perspective, you know, um, what's the best thing that happened uh, last year? Um, in, in terms, you know, from, from, from as a business person, as a person who is, 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 is closely watching what's happening in the economy, yeah, perhaps you can start with the good. That's right. If you, if you look at 2021, I think uh, the good thing was um, the 2021 good rainy season, which brought back some, uh, some hope and, uh, and excitement. Okay. And, um, Provided some bit of relief, you know, on the hunger side, you know, okay, and uh, did raise um, a lot of uh, excitement and expectation on uh, on the retail side in terms of, uh, you know, consumer spend and that sort of thing. But uh, uh, unfortunately, th that spend did not cover most of the sectors. It was still restricted to to, to, to basics, you know, okay. And um, one of the big problems was started off badly mm -hmm. with the lockdown in January and February. Yeah, COVID. Know, the COVID, yeah, COVID lockdown, you know. And then uh, you had the partial lockdowns in July and uh, in August, you know, yeah. But Did you manage to avoid it or uh, you, you're a survivor? To, to avoid COVID, yes, yes, I managed to avoid ah, COVID. Fantastic. Yeah, you know, and uh, I don't know how, so, you know. So You've been staying away from people. Staying away from people, <laughs> staying away from public places. Mm. Um, I haven't been in an aeroplane since uh, the 15th of March 2020. I mm. haven't left Zimbabwe, you know. So I always think the safest mode of travel for me is my car only. Uh, <laughs> where I'll be on my own, avoid, <laughs> you know, carrying passengers and that mm. sort of thing, you know. But I've just found that uh, avoiding the travel you know, avoiding the mixing, you know, does help, you know, in, mm. uh, in preventing the spread of, uh, <coughs> the spread of COVID, you know, okay? But at the same time, people can live like that. It becomes a threat to livelihoods, you know, mm. and, and, and we saw it last year here, yeah? you know, the struggles that the informal sector had, okay, you know, depending on how you define it as informal sector, I'm actually talking about the subsistence 
you know, informal yeah. sector. And to mouth. Yeah. That's right, yes. Because the informal sector now we have to define in Zimbabwe. We have to, to refine that definition. You've got the informal sector, which is big enough. It's informal to the extent that it's not regulated because those businesses are not registered. Some of mm. them don't pay tax. Some of them don't pay statutory deductions like your NASA, your pensions, and that sort of thing. That I call informal. But they're big enough to do that. And then you've got the subsistence informal sector, which is the vending. <laughs> and, and, and that sort of thing, yeah. Uh, that's, yeah. that's an interesting uh, dichotomy there. Yep. How, how does somebody get away with being big and not and not paying their tax and not paying their statutory deductions and yet they're, they're big? Or what, what do you term big? What I term big is you probably get people who employ 20 or so people. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. And what causes those people to stay in the informal system mm -hmm. is, best, is basically getting into a cash economy, okay. which is what we have become it's a cash in economy. terms of the US dollar. Okay. Right. The ZWL, you can trap through swipe and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But the US dollar, you know, you can't. You know, it's, mm -hmm. all, it's all very, very much informal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You know, yeah. So, you see. so the more you go on to a cash economy, mm -hmm. Okay, it's the more you actually become informal. Okay, mm -hmm. it's the more you destroy the tax base. What, what's of the what's driving this move towards a cash economy, do you think? Confidence. Confidence? Yes. Would you like to expand on that? Um, what you mean by confidence? Yeah. Um, yes, if I look at all the points that we talk about here, mm -hmm. and we are actually talking about symptoms, yeah. okay? of a fundamental problem. And the fundamental problem of everything that we have here, the values and, and what is this worth and what is that worth, mm -hmm. okay, right? And when we talk about liquidity, the underlying issue is the value of the ZWL, mm -hmm. right? And the value of the ZWL is determined by the confidence and trust. So okay. is, is, is confidence lacking in uh, It's ZWL? very much lacking, very much why, lacking. Why, why is it lacking? I, I mean, it's the historical. central bank will tell you that they've been on a tight monetary policy. They have tried what they can. They've increased interest rates. Mm -hmm. So why is there still lack of confidence in the Zimbabwean dollar? Because of what happened in the past 2007, 2008. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And a repeat of that in the recent past. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Two, okay. Three years ago, yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, over the last three years, if you think mm -hmm. about it, mm -hmm. um, the Zim dollar has lost more than ninety percent of its value. Yeah. Ninety-six so, percent. Yeah. Yeah. So why would you have uh, faith and confidence in a currency that's given to losing value uh, in that way? So you, you, we know you're, you 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 tend to be on the pessimistic side of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, when you look back on last year, did anything positive happen in our economy? I think I think I tend to agree with uh, Tim. I think the rain season was actually a uh, a blessing for Zimbabwe. And why it's important, why a rainy season is good for Zimbabwe is because we import less. That's really the critical thing. Because when you look at food imports, first of all, that's where a lot of the corruption happens. So we end up paying grain that's, you know, $400 uh, a ton when really you should but be that's getting what we've been one. Paying, uh, local farmers, no, 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 it's, it's Zim harvest. dollars. Yeah. It's Zim dollars. Out there we pay. US dollars, mm -hmm. right? So uh, the fact that we are not importing, that's actually a good thing. Uh, the fact that uh, when you look at subsistence, when you look at, at a very basic level, if it doesn't rain, those people are dying. They literally die. And if it does rain, you subvert uh, death um, and, and poverty. So I think that to me was a, a good sign. The other less celebrated thing that actually happened, and I think Timber might disagree, but or you might also disagree, but I, th I actually think that what saved the economy to some extent was when the central bank allowed US dollar trading. People forget that this was actually in 2020, that uh, they came to the market and said, you can now trade in US dollars. And by allowing that, that actually allowed uh, U.S. dollars to come into the formal economy. And that has saved a lot of business. If you read through 
uh, you know, your Delta, Insco, a lot of businesses were safe because now they could freely trade in US dollars. So I would say those are the positives, the, the two most important positives, I would say, for 2021. Yeah, I tend to agree with you. I think you you guys have uh, covered the two major issues quite well. And it, it, it brings to mind a, a, a development that came through with the budget, which is this um, taxation requirement that if you have a business that sells in both Zim dollars and hard currency, uh, you should pay all your taxes in, in, in US dollars. Um, it's similar to some extent to the initial version of SI 127. Um, so do you see the government um, aggressively policing this new regulation or doing a U-turn like they did uh, with SI 127? And if, if, if they do follow through on it to the letter, what impact do you think it will have on business? Um, yeah, I, I must confess that I, I saw that Finance Act, especially in relation to incomes yesterday when I got a copy from Atma Mavolani, okay? But um, just looking at the salaries and, looking, and not looking at the business side, what you are actually saying at the end of the day, in the first instance, is that you are going to tax a ZWL salary in US dollars. <laughs> okay? Right? And where are those US dollars going to come from? Because that person has an end, the, the US dollars. Okay? Right? PAYE, the company is an agent. Right. The person who pays that tax is the employee. Yeah. Mm. He, the employee has an end, that US dollar. You know, you are deriving a US dollar ZWL. So you got that point one. And point number two, you've got the issue of the cost of employment. Because you are bringing in that ZWL, it's say the official exchange rate today, which is 105, right? And the, someone will argue and say the US dollar is 220, 230. So you should be bringing that at half that amount. So, yeah, so you've got an exchange rate issue problem there, and you have got a US dollar liquidity problem on the employee side. Mm -hmm. Right. From an employee's perspective as well, and what employers will do is for you to be able to contain the costs will basically just stop paying in US dollars and paying ZWL, yeah? Mm -hmm. And with the way inflation is going, despite the official statistics that inflation is, is this, this and that, which is, pro which is probably true, mm -hmm. okay? But our inflation statistics in this country lack a bit of depth and meaning, mm -hmm. right? In the, that worker will be coming back to you asking yeah. for more oh, money yeah. is because he's being paid in an unstable currency. currency. Yeah. So when I touch on the inflation subject, mm. um, you know, I always say our inflation can't be this low. Okay? When you try and convert the rentals into ZWL and the way they have gone up, and the cost of food and basics, the way they have gone So you're up. saying the basket itself, there's something problematic with the basket? So in the weighting of the, the basket. Weightings of the, basket. the weightings of the basket, yeah. Okay. You see, do, do for, you someone an internal, at, for someone uh, at the right? top, are, are you with me? Yeah. It could be right. But for someone at the bottom, who 90% of their income goes towards rent, transport, and their inflation is a lot more higher, you know. Mm -hmm. So one would like to see Zimstats coming in with inflation figures that take into account, you know, the living standards measures, okay? Where initially, you, in this country, you probably split it into three, LSM1, LSM2, and LSM3. That's when it's actually going to have meaning. Meaning, yeah. yeah. So, you know, you sit as a, as a CEO, you know, and, uh, you know, a guy comes through to your office and he says, you know, look, I, I can't cope. And you say, but no, the month on month, month, on month inflation, inflation is 5.4. Yes. And then he produces and then he's got, this list. He's, okay, yes. he's got his own list. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I think and that's then a very see, important yeah. point. It is very, very important, you know, yeah. that from uh, economic management, we, we start to split our inflation into the various LSOs. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting also because food inflation is actually way higher than your core inflation. Yes. 
yes. and food inflation affects more your yes. bottom up uh, the weight yeah the weight in terms of income for the yeah people. that's true yeah. that's yeah, true I, I think there's there's a bit more to discuss there so um let's pick it up after the break Welcome back. Yeah. Um, before the break, we were uh, just getting started on an interesting conversation around inflation and whether the numbers that we get out of Zimstat capture um, what's happening on the ground, particularly for um, those close to minimum wage. Well, what are your thoughts? I, I, I think that uh, perhaps this is the reason why we always need someone like Timber coming. Yeah, because I think they give us the, the reality check. Because you know what, we focus more on the official numbers, and the official numbers are that inflation is now at sixty percent, and month on month is five point six percent. But the lived reality, from what somebody in industry, you know, who gets to face people coming to him and telling, you know what, my rentals have gone up, my transport has gone up, my food has gone up. It's actually true that the inflation rate for the majority of people is way higher than the 60% that we're basing policy on. So when you look at a civil servant who's asking for a, a salary increment, it's based on the 60%, but their lived reality is probably way higher than that. And I think that's something that we need to really focus on. So, so what do you think uh, uh, <clears throat> Zimstats is missing in the numbers that they put together? Look, I, I think Zimstats can only get better and improve their methodology if the users ask them to. Okay. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is the users of those statistics. Yeah. Okay. What do they mean? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So for me, the most important thing is um, we tend to think of that inflation and those statistics in terms of monetary policy. Okay. You should be having the Minister of Labor Conf okay. talking about the about, statistics yeah. as well. Coming up with his own numbers. Yes, you should have social ministries talking about those statistics as well. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, th I think it's important. It's the use of the data, the interpretation, you know, and what ultimately in terms of social impact, what it means. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So what we have with an economy where the mathematics and the arithmetic are taking center stage. Mm. And the qualitative aspects of that mathematics and arithmetic is not Insane. being looked at. Okay, right. So what does it mean? It means to a guy, a factory worker who is toiling, to a vendor, these numbers don't mean anything because they don't leave those, those numbers. numbers. Yes. Yeah, I, actually, it, it, that... Um, it brings us quite nicely to um, the next question about last year, which is um, what went wrong? What's the worst thing that happened last year? And one of the things that um, when you look back at last year that happened is that we started the year with very high inflation, but it trended lower for most of the first half. And then somewhere in the middle of the second half, the inflation trend just um, started deteriorating and inflation started trending higher. And this is uh, in a year in which we had a very good rainy season. We had a much better uh, harvest than uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, we had almost a billion dollars in SDRs. So, so what happened? Where did we get things wrong in terms of inflation starting to trend higher in the second half of last year? Yeah, what inflation are you talking about? Are you talking so about month-on-month month inflation? So, so if you look at the official numbers... No, month-on-month month inflation month or month annual month, inflation. So month-on-month month inflation is trended lower for most yes. of the first half of the yes. year. And then somewhere around September, it yes. started ticking up. And yes. it went higher in October, November, yes. and December. And the same is true of the annual inflation. So somewhere yes. along the line, the trend was it was coming off, it was getting lower, which is positive. Mm -hmm. And then we saw the, a reversal in that trend. Right. Most of our inflation in this country is currency-induced, okay? Mm. 
if you look at the gap between the parallel market in 2020 and towards the end of 2020, in the little bit in January, February last year, the gap wasn't too wide. Yes. Right. And then the gap started to widen, okay? Which basically told you that, uh, you know, there isn't much use, the weighting of the use of the parallel market in terms of pricing is actually higher. Yeah. Okay. So effectively in this country, eventually, that movement in the parallel market rate is actually inflation rate. Right? Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's, that's what it is. Yeah. Mm. Uh, you know. well, why, why did we experience that though? Because last year, we, we did not import as much grain as in 2020, mm -hmm. and we had a, a, an unexpected windfall. This well, what, 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 is, what, what is, what, what is the, the classical definition of uh, inflation? Mm -hmm. Too much money chasing too few goods. Well, yeah. I think that explains part of it, right? Mm -hmm. If you're printing, regardless of what's happening in production, mm -hmm. and you keep on printing, mm -hmm. then that money has to somewhat find its way uh, chasing the US dollar, as you say. Yeah. That our Zim dollar is actually not chasing production. We're printing Zim dollars to chase after the US dollar. Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I would rather avoid this printing of money mm. subject, you know, because I, I don't understand that monetary economics, you know. And um, mm. I, I think one of the very most important things is people talk about chasing a few goods. The biggest good that people are chasing in this country is the US dollar. And the reason why they are chasing the US dollar is lack of confidence in the Zimbabwe dollar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is it lack of confidence in the Zimbabwe dollar or lack of confidence in the entire system? It's, it's lack of the, any reflection of any society or any country. Mm. The biggest price that the country has got, which determines its exports, determines its imports, determines its inflation, and determines its uh, comparative advantage, is the mm. exchange rate. Okay. Yeah. So it's a culmination of everything. It's a, it's a culmination of everything, yeah? Right. So there's lack of trust, there's lack of confidence. Okay? Yeah. Right? And um, I don't think there's any monetary policy or fiscal policy that, that can, can control that. No, no, no. Yeah. no, no. If, if I hear him properly, he, he's saying the situation in Zimbabwe right now is such that even if you increase interest rate, so suppose tomorrow the governor wakes up and he increases interest rates to 300%, mm -hmm. would it affect... The, the strength of the Zim dollar? Would people suddenly have confidence in the Zim dollar? So, okay, I, I have a different view. I think um, <clears throat> I tend to agree with the idea that there is no faith and confidence in the Zim dollar, but I do think that um, if we had policy correction over a long enough period, it would start to build faith and confidence. Because on any given Sunday, we're on a path of either further deteriorating the faith and confidence mm -hmm. or improving it. Um, so when we do things like um, this finance act that says, look, um, you must pay all your taxes in US dollars, um, I Regardless think that takes away not, faith yeah. and confidence in, in the local currency. Um, <clears throat> and if we were to wake up tomorrow and increase interest rates or make the auction truly an auction, then that would build confidence. And But it, 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 there's no magic bullets that would restore confidence overnight. But Rufaro, you're, take not, you're three not answering months, the six question. Six months, a year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rufaro, you're not answering the question. If we were to do the right things for two years or even three years and we were to increase interest rates, do you think that Zimbabweans will have confidence in the local currency? I think so. I think if we do the right things over a long enough period of time, okay. um, faith and confidence, we will, will restore faith and confidence in the currency. Um, okay. I, I think our problem has been that... Um, we come up with a policy uh, action that is positive. People get excited. They think, look, we're doing the right thing. And then we do something that takes us two steps backwards from that policy initiative. Um, so if you remember when we introduced the interbank market, you were talking about the parallel market and the uh, official rate being very close to, to each other. Um, the interbank market worked. Uh, it got to a point where I remember individuals changing 50 bucks or 100 bucks were quite happy to go to a bank and do it, mm -hmm. even if because the discount wasn't material. Mm. And... Just as people were getting confident in that system, you know, um, they stopped letting it uh, trade freely, and uh, uh, the gap started growing, and people lost. Timber, would you agree that it's policy there's, reversals but again, that's uh, feeding into the confidence? Yeah, issue. you see, there's another school of thought. You know, interestingly mm. enough, you know, 
this matter was discussed at some meeting that I attended, and um, you know, I actually remarked at that meeting. You know, where mm -hmm. people said, "Look, you move the auction rate slightly to restore confidence," and I said, "I bet you the parallel market rate will go as well." <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly what happened. Yeah. yeah, you see, this is a cool design. Mm. Yeah, you you can move the auction rate today to one fifty or two hundred. The parallel market will go more because you haven't got the U.S. dollars. Yeah, it's simple mm. supply and demand. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Okay. And secondly, when we talk about confidence, Rufaro as well, we tend to talk about confidence at the top level, at the business level. Okay. But I think one of the most important thing is the vendor there has got to be confident about his future as well. The ordinary people, you know, yeah, you know, okay. We can't engage in elitism, you know, mm. that for as long as those who have got capital say things are fine, you know, then things are fine, no, no. Just to be on the ground. So it has to so be So your confidence on moves from just purely policy yes. to actually the the social contract yes. the, the the people on the ground yes. are they confident in the future and getting so, them to believe okay. you know okay and that you are on a journey okay and this is a very long journey with very small steps okay you know that's a hard sell well that is where the skills that are needed for that are social skills or their social skills, yeah. not economics. Economics is a social science as well. Mm. Yeah, it's social skills. Yeah, okay. It's uh, how do you, you know, get the buy-in from exactly. everybody? How do you get the buy-in from everyone? You know, okay, you know, okay. And by saying yes, you lo we lo you lost your money before, but if we start this journey, you are going to rebuild. Mm. It's, so it's been suggested in some circles, however, that. Um, one of the things that we could do that would restore confidence almost instantly is just to say, you know what, we've run this experiment with the Zim dollar, we've had inflation, we've had all these issues, it's not working, let's just suspend it for the next five years while we get our house in order and deal with US dollars that everybody's comfortable with. Do you think that would work? As long as you have, as long as government will have enough US dollars to sustain itself. Mm. Okay. Right. And I mean, you can talk to anybody who's trading on uh, even the US dollar Nostro here. Okay. You know, you can't run a business, you know, on US dollars only. It's very, very difficult. You know, the ZWL and RTGS is still a big component. Okay. You've got to look at the sources and the availability of that US dollar, you know. Okay. But if you look at central government, you know, can government even run a whole payroll? in US dollars, and what would be the source of that funding be? Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, I always say, you know, US dollar, unless there is an injection, okay, and there is serious budgetary support on government's part in US dollars, you know, mm. then it's, it's not a, it's not a, you know. Yeah. So, so then how, how do you balance, what's the balancing act? Because on one end, we know that the, the guy on the show floor is not interested in Zim dollar. Yeah. But you're saying as a business or as an economy, as a government, we still need the Zim dollar to facilitate. So how do you manage the two? Yeah, you see, you see you've, got, you've got to try and manage the two. You know, it's a, it's a much more broader issue and, uh, and bigger problem than, you know, than, <laughs> than a lot of people see. You know, okay, why is there retentions? Well, it's a tax, isn't it? It's a, a no, 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 no. What are the liquidity implications of a retention? Mm. Debt capital, debt yeah. money. Dead, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. right. Retentions, debt capital, debt money. Okay. Three retentions are sending a signal. Okay, that this is the preferred currency. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You go. You are Chinese uh, exporter. Just, just simplify that. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean? Because when if you say you, this is the preferred currency, so that's why we're retaining it. Because if it wasn't the preferred currency, we wouldn't retain it. Exactly. 
It's lack of co- it's lack of confidence. <laughs> so, are you saying the government itself mm-hmm. lacks confidence in its own Zimbabwe dollar? By implication, <laughs> you see. By implication, okay. yeah. You know, if the South African government woke up today, or the Chinese woke up today, and started paying their exporters retentions, why would they be doing that? Mm. Yeah. Why would they be doing that? Yeah. Okay, if you look at South Africa, look at China, I'll use those because those are biggest, big trading partners, okay? Right? They export in euros or in US dollars. When those euros and US dollars, you know, when those... When they exchange, yeah. When the receipts are received, they get credited their accounts in rands or in RMB. And the US dollar is held as a reserve by the central bank. They do that and it's acceptable to everyone because whenever they need their imports, they can go to the bank and get it. Yes, yeah. right? So it must mean that something went wrong, <laughs> that there was no confidence that if it was deposited in the reserve bank, I'll get it. Mm. <laughs> and then that's why you have the, those, yeah, okay? And as a result, that's why you've d- 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 created this $1.7 billion debt capital. Mm. It doesn't have the confidence. Yes. On that uh, rather uh, depressing note, we'll take another break and uh, <laughs> come back and discuss uh, 2022. Welcome back. Um, during the break, you made quite an interesting point that uh, piqued our interest that uh, I think our audience would uh, love to hear about uh, certain schools. Yeah. W- w- what I was basically saying there, Rufaro, is um, some of these things and these experiences, you'll never learn them at Harvard. You'll never learn them at Oxford or Cambridge because they've never gone through that. Maybe they did in the 16th century, <laughs> but not in the modern day, you know. Okay, we will then come back to, at some stage, I hope to discuss, to say where to as an economy. Mm. Okay, is conventional economic theory applicable in this environment? Mm. Okay, right? Or we should be talking about practical and applied economics. But I'm going to, I'm going to be, um, a devil's advocate here, mm-hmm. um, because what you're saying sounds awfully fam- similar to what we heard from uh, our former governor, uh, mm-hmm. you know, basically um, disparaging mm-hmm. what he referred to as bookish economics, which is basically uh, well-established economic theory, you know, and the idea was that we're Zimbabwe, we're different, um, <laughs> we don't, we must um, plot our own path. You know that, and, and and come up with our own systems and economics that doesn't necessarily comport with well-established uh, theory. So so, and we ran that experiment between um, you know in, in the early two thousands up until two thousand and eight, and I think you can agree with me that that experiment failed miserably. Were people were people confident? No, people were not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right in 1965, when UDI. Mm. You know, came in. Yeah? Okay. Well, how was this economy run? I think things went, got worse after UDI. Yeah, what happened? A lot of the infrastructure that you see here, mm. okay, this was all created by Rhodesia. Yeah? Okay? All these commercial farms, you know, the biggest commercial farming story in the world was created by Rhodesians. Okay? So, what failure are you talking about? Well, I think I, I think Tinashe can articulate that quite well because well, I think <coughs> I think I think uh, remember it's just misuse of resources. So when you look at 1965, what happened is it was more inward looking. It was fighting a war that we shouldn't be. If we hadn't been fighting that war, a lot of that capital would have gone into actual production. But I think where I hear him, and I want him to 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 spend a bit more time talking about about it is the issue of confidence because where he's coming from is he's saying is 1965 despite all those challenges 
despite all those challenges, despite a government that went wrong, guys were still farming and they were producing. Guys were still building industry, um, despite everything else that was happening. Why is it in Zimbabwe, despite the global issues, why is it we're still not producing? We're not producing enough. We're not doing enough. Why? Why not? And his argument is it's a lack of confidence. So I want him to, maybe in this segment, to, 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 to take it apart, this lack of confidence. So from a micro perspective, you're saying, worry less about the econometrics and the statistics and what they mean. Because actually those statistics from an inflation perspective, they don't speak to the lived experience of a common man. Yeah. And what we need to do is to bring it back to the common man. Yeah, what, what I'm saying about that is in 1965, you had businessmen, entrepreneurs who believed that they would make their wealth and fortune in Rhodesia, and they had to make it work. From that note, okay? what, what do you think of the tea? It's very nice, thanks. You know, my, my wife loves this, you know. Uh, oh, she's, actually, she's also a tea lover. Yeah, I actually, okay. actually now understand why she... Oh, know. fantastic. Well, yeah. You must tell her about this experience then. I will tell her about this, Earl Grey. It might convince our good man yeah, to join us. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a coffee guy myself. Uh, I do indulge in tea from time to time. But uh, okay. uh, not enough caffeine. Yeah. So he had a, a, a group of people who actually believed, right? And... Um, what did you have during that time? You had champions in agriculture, you had champions in manufacturing, and you had champions in banking. Okay. And invariably, your champions in agriculture, okay, were proven and capable farmers. You late CG Tracy and so forth. Okay, the pioneers of, of, of cotton seed growing in this country in the creation of the peak industry board and that sort of thing. It was created by, by people, okay, who saw their home as being Rhodesia, okay? Mm. And they had to make it because they could not, they never thought so of making it why did they have elsewhere. that confidence? Where because was it coming from? Because they, they never saw an alternative elsewhere. Okay, okay. so I, 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 I like right. where you're going with this part. Yeah. And, and, and they had the skills as well, okay? Despite the lack of formal education. So you're saying we've got an alternative, we can jump the border? Yes. yes. Well, look, we, uh, we need to have that confidence and that belief that we can't make it anywhere in the world except... In Zimbabwe. Except if we make it in our own home country. But, but, but isn't the difference between the Rhodesian experience between 1965 and 1980, uh -huh. and what we've experienced since then, mm -hmm. uh, one of ideology. So what I mean by that is, notwithstanding that it was a strategic era to, a to, to, to declare mm -hmm. uh, UDI in 1965, yep. and that they complicated their lives uh, immensely mm -hmm. by engaging in a war, they all believed in free market capitalism mm -hmm. and in the um, importance of entrepreneurs in building businesses, mm -hmm. in building infrastructure at a national level mm -hmm. to support yes. uh, free markets. Whereas if you look at um, economic policy in Zimbabwe today, mm -hmm. um, it's hard to tell what we really believe in. Are we free market capitalists? Mm -hmm. Are we command and control communists? We, you know, what is our common ideology? It's, you can't tell by looking at the policy that we're actually practicing. So is, is that not the problem, that we are not singing from the same hymn sheet in terms of our ideology? You're, pro you're absolutely right. That is where the biggest problem is. Mm. Yeah. We're not singing from the same hymn sheet. Mm. Yeah. So how do, how, do we, how do we get everybody to sing from the same hymn sheet? I think, I think for me, there has to be a lot of engagement between government and the entrepreneurs and the industrialists, okay? It can't be a case we need to talk to CZI because we've got a crisis, because the parallel market is gone. <laughs> no, 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 okay? It has to be constructive, you know? We've got to be saying is what kind of economy do we want, 
okay right yeah and have the broader idea i don't like the term vision because it's been abused you, know? <laughs> you, you, you have the you have the broader idea of where you want to go mm-hmm. right and then you have got guys who can practically apply themselves okay yeah okay yeah. I'll give you a simple example. Before I came here, I watched your, um, your episode mm-hmm. where you talked about, and Sonia was here, mm-hmm. about agricultural production and, 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 and so forth, you know. And, um, you know, nobody knew what the numbers were. <laughs> yeah, okay. Fair enough. They will eventually come. Right. But um, you go to Brazil, Argentina, Okay, China, South Africa, you have these crop estimate committees, government sits in there, the farmers association sits in there, but the farmers association representatives are specialists, guys who grow maize, guys who grow soya, and that sort of thing. And they give these statistics so that there's a clear direction of where things are going. Mm. Yeah. Why am I concerned about that? I'm concerned about that because of the irregular rainfall that we have had in the country now. All right. Okay? I would have expected someone, agriculture being a key cog in our economy, okay, for somebody to be actually giving us what the outlook is going to be, Mm. yeah, for the harvest this year. Mm. Yeah? Well, it speaks again to your running theme that... Yes the lived numbers yeah. are not the numbers that are coming out, that we are churning out mm-hmm. at a macro level. Yeah. So the farmers probably know. But, they are, but you see, they are not, they, not there is feeding. no communication. There's are, no are communication. You, yeah. It's not being okay. fed right through the That's system. Right. So that it's a commonly known That's number. Right. Yeah. So now I sit here and say, hey, if it doesn't turn out to be good, okay, mm-hmm. this might happen. Then US dollar, becomes a non-productive asset <laughs> under the pill. <laughs> are you, this is exactly what is happening. Yeah. Are you with me? Mm-hmm. You know, non-availability of information and non-sharing of information. Mm. Okay, right. Okay, you can't blame the government only on that. Okay, if I was a, a supplier, an input supplier to the agricultural in- industry, it is in their interest to say that. Yeah. Okay, but the guy will be selling ammonium nitrate now. To, mm. to a farmer, okay, whose maize is still below knee length, okay, yeah. and it needs another 110 days to mature, okay, which means there has to be rainfall in that 110 days, mm. okay, and MSD is telling you that rains will taper off in March. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 know, you, you yeah. see, let's be serious. Yeah, mm. right across the whole economic set, let's be serious. Okay. So, so you're saying there's the, a disconnect between the lived real, reality, the economics on the ground, yes, yes. and what's actually happening, and yes. the policy decisions that we're making yes. is far removed from the reality Most on the ground. Cases, yeah. And then secondly, even the, the private sector players, okay, you know, I don't think you'd be honest or the, to, 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 your, to your customer selling him seats today. I, don't, I don't think it's being dishonest, in, in my view. <laughs> yes, it's almost mid-January. <laughs> yeah, it's almost mid-January, you know. You see, these are the topical issues. These are the things that we should be talking about. Okay, right. So when things don't go right, you know, we start saying, oh, it's because of this. But then, you know, you, 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 yeah, you see, I, I come back to saying, build confidence. Let's have systems, Sharing of information, information processes and systems and that bring predictability yeah. rather than speculation. So one of the controversial uh, issues that, you know, looking back at last year and um, marrying it to, your, to the theme of the lack of confidence um, is infrastructure. You know, so we've had this massive spending um, on our road infrastructure. I think um, it's, 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 it's visible to anybody who uses our roads. And, you know, the controversy is, you know, on the one hand, it's fantastic to have um, a road network that is improving, that is getting better, that is being built out. But then there's a the question of how is it being funded? And is the high inflation that we're witnessing 
the result of that. You know, when we, when we weigh the costs and benefits of this program, um, how do you see it? Are we better off? How does it cause inflation? Well, if we're printing the money uh, to pay for it, uh, it's inflationary. That's a very simplistic view. Okay? Um, you know, I watch a lot of Bloomberg, right? And when um, America went into the stimulus package, the consensus amongst economists in America is not the printing of money that, that is the problem. It's how you use the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's how you use the money. Okay, right? In the first instance, we have used the money to build the necessary infrastructure, of which the benefits are there for all to see. Mm -hmm. Okay? And I can tell you the repair bills for vehicles and that sort of thing, you know, and come down. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, yeah? Okay? You know, because the state of our roads, I mean, for you to get to work, I mean, deplorable, yeah. It was deplorable. In some other <clears> countries, you take a car for service every 15,000, 30,000 kilometers. Mm. But in this country, you're taking it at 5,000. Just simple economics <laughs> lucky, just tells yeah. you that yes. you, you are unnecessary spending mm. because of poor infrastructure. You know, I'm just using basic mm. examples, you know. So infrastructure spending is good. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. The biggest question is, you know, and then what happens to that money after that? I don't know. Well, I, I, I've got a different view. Yeah. And this is my, uh, going back to the numbers, it's like agriculture. When you go back to the numbers, mm -hmm. uh, I think that there's a, a lot of hullabaloo around the infrastructure. But if you look at the, the roads, so if you look at how much road has been tarred, what they've done, I think the last number I checked, it was 265 mm -hmm. kilometers that they have, you know, mm -hmm. they've built um, the airport, parliament building, what, two airports, and then you've got Wangye, uh, Station 7 and 8. But if you compare it during the GNU period, we've actually, we actually got more infrastructure spending in that five-year period than now. Mm -hmm. you know, so I think that the numbers, we're saying a lot about the infrastructure that we're spending on, but in real terms, it's actually not comparable to during the, the GNU period. We actually expanded more during the GNU period in terms of infrastructure. Then to the second point, how it's funded. My issue is, if you look at the GNU period, it was actually funded by FDI, by externals. It wasn't us who were funding it. So my problem with us funding it, it's actually uh, crowding out of private sector. So ordinarily, we, we've got a limited amount of money in the economy. And that limited amount of money, most of it is now going to government and it's not going to industry because you still need industry to fire. So while it is a good thing, infrastructure spending is a good thing, but I think where the money comes from is also important because if you, um, let's look at the SDRs, for example, and I think now it's close to 300 million that has gone into this infrastructure spend. But if you think about it, were we not better off, because there's somebody who's sitting in South Africa, if we had confidence, who was willing to spend on our infrastructure, was willing to bring in the 350 million here, and then the 350 million SDRs would have gone to industry. So to me, it's just a question of uh, opportunity cost. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. Look, it's very subjective. You know, mm. what is beneficial and what is non-beneficial. You know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, you know, we. The other thing I think we need to talk about is we actually run the risk of talking about billions. <laughs> okay, mm. that we actually don't know what the value, the purchasing is. power <laughs> of is. Okay, and um, you know, we impaired the Zimbabwe dollar from one to one to one hundred and six. That's ten thousand six hundred percent. Yeah, in three yeah. years. In yeah. three years, yeah. Has this purchasing power? of the money that we have now, the same as it was before the devaluation. Yeah. yeah, that's a very good point. Okay, very so that's why, you know, I come back to monetarists and so forth. And when you say push up into, you just simply close the country down. <laughs> and, you know, So conventional monetary mm. policy, just one has to be very careful. You, you see what I'm saying, you know? And when you look at incomes, that's what people are actually complaining about, saying, 
it was 500 US. And today it should be, you know, similar. You know, it's similar, yeah? Okay, now look at uh, bank balance sheets. Okay, mm. have they grown to, to, to reflect that, uh, you know, impairment yeah. of, the, of the currency or not? Okay, yeah. so we are already, without doing anything, in a very tight ZWL monetary situation. Okay, which if, in my opinion, you made it a lot more tighter, you're gonna have casualties. Yeah, yeah you know, we, 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 with, without any doubt, mm. you know. So going forward, what gives you optimism about Zimbabwe? What, what gives me optimism about Zimbabwe is you would know very well as an, um, as an investment banker, mm. you know very well as well as a, as a stockbroker. Yeah. What does capital love? Capital likes to pay for things low and then there's growth, mm. and then they exit, yeah? Mm. So if you look at Zimbabwe in the long term, overcome all your short-term difficulties, it's an so investor's a yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, if, 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 if you look at it, right, where is the growth going to come from? One, mm. Zimbabwe needs to retrace to a normal economy, yeah, where we should be, right? And then from there, Zimbabwe still has to grow. Yeah, so there's recovery and then there's growth. There's recovery, there's yeah. growth. Catch up. Yeah. That's right. We, and we, that we was need this, to catch up. That yeah. was the story in 2009. That was the story mm. in 2010. Yeah? Okay. Mm. Because people say, Jesus, that's recovery and growth. And do you see people in the diaspora coming back? Or is that a, now a reality that we have to live with? I think you've got to live with the fact that people in the diaspora are, are, are not going to come back. <laughs> okay. Because uh, most of them are well into their fifties and sixties, <laughs> their families are established there, mm. and it's going to be very difficult for them for them to come back. America, yeah, America. you got to accept that, you know. Mm. Uh, but I always say, from um, you know, IP intellectual property, we still have it here. We still have it here. It hasn't emigrated. Okay. What you had emigrating is your employee type of person, the mm. lower middle class, you know, a guy who needs certainty, a job in the salary. Okay. Your entrepreneurs are still here. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, your entrepreneurs are still here. So for the purposes uh, of uh, this Friday's uh, episode, we will end here. Look out for a bonus episode as we continue our conversation uh, with Temba. Um, COVID is real. Please um, take care and um, have a great weekend. Be good. And if you can't be good, be good at it. <laughs>